So now we have Haley Thompson, uh, and we're going to talk about uh, the distrib distributed music programming with Gleam, Beam, and the Web Audio API. API. Give it up. OK, so hello, everyone. Um, yeah, today I'm going to be talking about a little web app I've been making using Beam, Gleam, and the Web Audio API. Um, just before I get into that, maybe a little bit about who I am. My name is Haley. I'm a front-end Elm developer, actually. So I don't really do any back-end stuff. I'm totally new to Beam, Erlang, and Elixir. Um, I've been doing Elm professionally almost exclusively for about three years now, and kind of personally for four or maybe five. I'm also a PhD student. Um, I'm writing up my thesis at the moment on programming language design and particularly how it relates to sound and music computing. And finally, I am a Gleam community person. Um, if you've ever dropped into the Gleam Discord, you've probably seen me spending way too much of my own time there. <laughs> um, so distributed audio, what the heck am I talking about? What am I going to be making? This nondescript looking box is called a mono. And one of the things it can be is a step sequencer. And so what that means is each of these buttons represents a note that can be played. And the columns are steps in time, and the rows are different notes, different frequencies. And what I'd like to make is one of these in software. Um, and I want to supercharge that, basically, by making it networked and collaborative. So we want everyone to be working on the same instrument, you know, on different computers over the web. The way I structured this talk, um, I'm not going to be going into too many technical details about Gleam or the app itself. Um, if you were here earlier this morning, Harry's talk would have done a really good job of introducing you to Gleam. And if you missed that, the language docs are a much better start than what I could give you. So instead, I'm first going to go over some of the languages I could have chosen and didn't, and then briefly explain why I picked Gleam. And then I'm going to give you a very, very abridged tour of the code base by basically building the thing from the ground up. So why not your favorite language? Why not JavaScript? Well, I've been doing Elm, as I said, for three, four, five years now. I've been in this great statically typed, pure functional fantasy land. Um, and the idea of going back to a mutable, dynamically typed, object-oriented thing um, terrifies me. I just don't want to do that at all. <laughs> so OK, why not Elm then? If I'm so used to it, why would I not use that? Well, I actually maintain a package for doing web audio things in Elm. But if you've ever used Elm before, you probably know it has a rather interesting take on for our function interfaces and interrupt with JavaScript. Um, and I just don't want to deal with that for this particular project. And then it also leaves the question open on what to choose for the back end. And really, I'd like just one language for the entire stack. And finally, why not Elixir? Well, I don't know it for a start. <laughs> um, as I understand, I'm still going to need to use a lot of JavaScript for the audio side of things, even if I use something like LiveView. Um, and I'm a bit of a type nerd, so the dynamic typing kind of puts me off a bit. For me, I think Gleam conveniently addresses all of these things. So I get to use the same language across the entire stack. Gleam targets both Erlang and JavaScript. And I get to share types across the stack as well. So um, my audio code and my messaging and stuff, this can all be well typed across kind of the, the network boundary. It also got a really good interrupt story. Um, the FFI in Gleam is very simple, very, very easy to use. And so if I need to dip into JavaScript or Erlang or Elixir, that can be quite easy. And also, it's a very simple language. Um, so for someone like me that's very new to back-end programming, this is a great kind of soft introduction to Beam and OTP and that sort of thing. Well, I didn't go to that slide, but that's the slide I just did. <laughs> the 
first thing I want to do is make some sounds. And to do that, we need to have a bit of an understanding of the Web Audio API. And so a super, super quick primer on that is it's a lowish level browser API for making sounds on the web. You create audio nodes, so they might be sound sources like an oscillator or some signal processing like a filter or a delay, and you connect those into a graph in JavaScript. But all the signal processing happens like in native code that we don't write and we don't control. So this is just a, a very brief example of what that looks like in JavaScript. Um, I don't know about any of you, but to me, this is really, really clunky, right? We create a bunch of nodes, then we set a bunch of properties, then we have to remember to connect them up, and then we have to remember to start some of them, and then at the end, hopefully, we get some sound. Um, instead, what I'd like to do is get a really nice declarative API for this, something that we might be used to for doing like view code. And for that, I'm going to model that with these two types in Gleam. So we have a node type with a field T, which stands for type. And so that says whether it's an oscillator or a delay or a filter. And we have a list of parameters that we want to set on that node, and then a list of connections. And then we end up with something like this. So this is the same audio graph that we just saw with, a, in my opinion, a much, much nicer API. Um, you kind of get implicit connections based on um, how nested things are, kind of like a DOM tree or HTML or something. What I'd need to do then is write a little bit of JavaScript to turn those Gleam values into some web audio code. And I'm not going to go into any detail on that here. It took me about 50 lines of JavaScript to do that, and that is the only not Gleam code that I wrote in this whole app. So assuming that all works, the next thing <laughs> we want to do is render something onto a page. For that, we're going to use a framework that I made called Luster. I've said maybe like 50 times now that I'm a big Elm fan, and so Luster takes a lot of the ideas from Elm, particularly its model view update or the, the Elm architecture, and it basically applies it on top of React. So we actually have a wrapper for React, and we can use React components and all that sort of thing with this nice kind of unidirectional state flow. So we start off with a model. And this is what we're going to derive both our user interface and our audio code from. And so here, I don't have the type up on the screen, but where we've got rows, a row has the note, so the frequency to play, and then an array of steps that either indicate whether it's on or off. And we take that model, and we render it into something. Now, Gleam doesn't have macros. It doesn't have a templating engine or really anything like JSX or anything like that. What we have is just functions. So here, we're calling element.div, and we're setting a class on it, and then inside, we're rendering a button. And we have this message, this update step message. And basically, that's going to be fired whenever the button is clicked on. And that goes through the runtime into our update function. We uh, change some rows, update some program state, and we, the cycle continues. Okay, So the state changes, our UI changes, more interactions, blah, blah, blah. If all goes well, we end up with something that looks like this. And what we have here is just a simple client web app. This is the sequencer that I've been talking about. This only runs on the client, so anyone that loads this up is going to get their own thing. And so far, we haven't spoken about backend, so I'm assuming you're serving this, I don't know, on GitHub pages or your own server or whatever. And so what we want to do next is serve this with some Glean code. And to do that, we're going to use two more packages. One is called Glisten. This is a fairly low-level package that sets up a supervisor and manages a pool of connections. It can manage things like TCP connections and sockets and this sort of thing. And on top of that, another package called Mist, which is a web server written in Gleam that provides a kind of dead simple HTTP server that you can then configure to accept WebSocket connections or do SSL connections, these sorts of things. So far, I've been 
heavily abridging the code. This is pretty much all you need to, to start serving some static files using mist and glisten. The magic kind of happens just in this very simple serve static asset function, which takes a path. Ideally, would do some sanitization on the path, but I've left that out to be brief. Um, reads the file, if the file exists, we just respond and we make sure we set the right headers and that's it. Now we can host our little web app statically with more Gleam code. The final piece of the puzzle then is client-server communication. How do we make this distributed? How do we have everyone connected to the same instance? So for that, we need to set up WebSockets. And MIST makes this dead simple as well. You just set up an upgrade handler on any particular path that you want. Here, it's just the WebSocket path. And that code looks like this. You set up some event listeners on you know, when the socket opens or closes, and then also how you want to handle messages. And on WS message here, essentially just JSON decodes the message into something well typed and sends that off to our app's main process. On the front end, we need to hook up WebSockets as well. Um, there's a package for that called Luster WebSocket. And this isn't made by me. Someone else has very gratefully made this. And for that, we just need to call ws.init in our app's init function. And that will set up everything that we need. So it will do all the kind of plumbing in the runtime to make sure that events are dispatched and end up in our update function. And so here, we pass in this WebSocket message constructor. And then whenever we get an event on the WebSocket that goes into our update function, we can change our state, do whatever we need to do, and that will affect the app and renders and so on. Now I mess oh, that is the wrong text, but oh well. I mentioned earlier that one of the great things about Gleam is that we can share types across the front and the back end. And so what we can start to do is have to typed messages between client and server. And so here we have a to backend message type. So this is what the clients will send to the backend to ask it to update some state change. So for example, start the sequence, stop it, toggle a, toggle a, toggle a step on or off, update some parameters. And then we'd handle that in our app's main update function on the backend. So here we're updating some shared state, and this is the state that is shared across all clients. And then we're broadcasting that state back to clients. And we do that with a to front end message. And so this is the same kind of idea in reverse. This will tell the client to update a particular part of its model. That looks like this. Again, we decode the JSON that we're getting from the WebSocket, and then we can just branch off of that. And this would be called in our update function. And so what we end up with is, is this really neat, tidy kind of loop where the server sends a message to the client with some state to render. Then user interaction happens, an event is emitted from there. And instead of updating the state locally, we send a message back to the backend. That updates the state on the backend, and then that state is broadcast back to the clients. And we have the same kind of event loop that we had just on the client, but now across across the network. Now, I've waffled on for a bit. I think it would be cool to maybe see a demo. I'm not sure we can get the sound. I contact some of the video guys. Let, let's try to do it we make it work. Um, what would you like me to do? Uh, try to play audio and I will see if I can. Yeah, uh, we are trying to play audio with the mini jack. I can just play out the speaker, it's fine. Oh. It's not a very big room. Uh, yeah, the mini jack audio is not coming out. Okay, well, while they're dealing with that, I'll just explain what's happening. I think it's kind of clear. So we have two clients open here. Um, you need to 
Okay. So that's important. Okay. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe it was me that was having no sound. If it was muted, maybe. Let me try. No. No, okay, cool. <laughs> cool it wasn't user error, it was okay. Um, so we have two instances going on here. For some reason, that one isn't going. There we go. Um, so I can change the parameters on this side, and you can see that they're reflected on the other. Add steps or whatever. Um, yes. And so this is all totally networked. Conceptually, you could run this, you know, on the web and have... I mean, this is just running locally, but I would have hoped that people could um, open it up here. So just to recap, we've got a full stack Gleam app. We have an OTP server on the back end. We have a React app on the front end, both written in pure Gleam, both sharing types. And we have this live view style of communication. But specifically, or kind of crucially, um, this communication is well typed. And so we know all the messages that we're supposed to be handling on both the front end and the back end. <coughs> and this is just a quick kind of look at how many lines of code were in this code base. And so you can see. 85 lines of JavaScript was all that was needed, and everything else is pure Gleam, um, which I think is pretty cool. It's pretty exciting that you can do that today. So, yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yep. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, maybe it was apparent from your presentation, but um, I just wanted to check um, how are the different cli clients synchronized? Because, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay, so um, let me go back. We had this model, and when I introduced that, each client had their own model. Um, and so basically the server has its own version of this now. And it's broadcasting, every time the sequence resets, it broadcasts the entire model to make sure everything stays in sync. Um, and then whenever one client changes something, it broadcasts a message to tell the clients to update their local version. So it depends on how uh, the clients get this new information and it's yeah, relevant. Yeah. Um, and that's more or less okay enough for yeah, synchronization. I mean, yeah, it seems to be like kind of fine. I guess if one person is in Australia and one is over here, there's going to be like some noticeable ping. But, um, but then you wouldn't. Uh, yeah, right. You wouldn't be stupid enough to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? So I don't know much about the uh, the Gleam front end. In fact, I don't know much about Gleam at all. But I don't know much about the Gleam front end stuff. What? Uh, what was necessary to write in JavaScript that you couldn't write in Gleam? Um, yeah, the JavaScript is just the part that actually renders the uh, renders the web audio stuff. Uh, so, 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 so that, that API is not available uh, in Gleam? Well, so Gleam doesn't really have any brow browser uh, API okay. bindings oh, okay. at the moment. Right. I mean, I could have I could have FFI'd the whole thing and probably taken a bit more into Gleam. But for that particular bit, I, I've done that JavaScript myself quite a few times. And so it was just quicker to, okay. to just um, keep, keep that little bit in JavaScript. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Any other question? In the beginning, you presented an API uh, for connecting audio nodes well, with, uh, by using nesting. Uh, my question is, how would that work with more complex uh, graphs that have forks and merges or yeah. feedbacks? Uh, just, uh, so you're talking about this, right? Yeah, um, I actually presented a kind of strips town version of the actual API. And there we have like 
keyed nodes, so you can assign like an ID to a node, and then there's like ref nodes as well, so you can refer to other nodes in the graph outside of the tree. And so that way you can keep this kind of tree-like structure, but jump out and refer to anything you want and have loops or whatever. And so actually that's what's happening in this app. So we've got that delay that's going on in the background, and that's the feedback loop, and then it's going. Yeah. Does that make sense? Cool. Any other question? Uh, hello, sorry, I, I didn't see the full uh, presentation. I arrived uh, in the middle, and uh, maybe I, I will ask something that you already uh, shared. But I would like to know if uh, can we apply this environment for live coding, improvise the uh, performance uh, of music, yeah. or it's mainly dedicated to, for building clients and applications? Yeah, I think. I think you could totally transfer these ideas to like live coding or performance. I mean, ultimately, it just comes down to sending messages, right? And so here, um, we're sending like user interaction events, but you could do conceptually the same thing with code snippets or some other kind of data transfer. Yeah. Any other question? Hi, great talk. Uh, I was wondering, you said it was compatible with React, and so will it be compatible with other frameworks like uh, Vue or uh, that yeah. in the future? At the moment, it's just React, but it's been on my to-do list for a while now to kind of factor out the state management that Luster does away from the actual renderer that you choose. So right now, just React, some nebulous time in the future, it could be view or morph dom or whatever. Okay, I think there's time for one more question, if there is one. Okay. Thanks for talk. But uh, if uh, someone want to use some hardware devices to connect, does Glim support some uh, other wrappers over Web API to speak with some hardware parts like via USB, serial port, etc. Right. Um, do you mean from the browser side or from, yeah? Yeah, so like I said, um, there aren't really any official bindings at the moment, but as I also said, the, the FFI story is very si simple. So it's actually quite easy to create bindings for these browsers yourself, which is pretty much the situation where we're at today. I mean, the, the biggest thing maybe that's holding Gleam back at the moment is the ecosystem is just very, very young. And so, we don't have many packages or bindings for a lot of stuff. Okay, thank you again for your talk. Thank you.